Hello everyone and welcome to Using Digital Platforms to Maximise Engagement with Chinese International Students, a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Synorbis. My name is Julia Gilmore, I'm the Content Manager for Special Projects at Times Higher Education and I'll be chairing today's discussion. Please note that a recording of today's webinar will be available on demand along with a summary article on the Times Higher Education website should you wish to revisit this discussion or share it on social media or with colleagues. I'm delighted to be joined today by my panel of experts from academia and industry, who are Nicholas Chu, the CEO and founder of our webinar partner, Synorbis, and Dan Harris, attorney specializing in China law, technology, and international law at Harris Bricken. Dan has kindly shared a PDF outlining Chinese data privacy basics for the audience. I'll be posting this in the chat box at some point during the webinar, and it will be emailed to you after the session. Those of you in the audience today will be able to put questions to the panel using the Q&A box provided. We will try to answer as many of these as possible during the closing 5, 10, 15 minutes if there are enough questions of this webinar discussion, but we might also pick up on some questions as we go along. So recruitment and retention of international students has never been more of a challenge for higher education institutions as blended and digital delivery gives cohorts more options than ever to personalize their learning. China poses a unique recruit recruitment proposition for North American universities with falling numbers of enrollments, China's recent personal information protection law, and an increased desire by students to study remotely and asynchronously, all creating new strategic challenges. I will now hand over to Nicholas Chu, who will give us an overview of the Synorbis platform and how they work with universities. So over to you, Nicholas. Thanks a lot, Julia. Thanks for having me. Um, so China has its own digital ecosystem and most of the marketing channels that institutions use in, in the US or in the UK to, to promote themselves or their programs are neither accessible nor popular in China. There's no Google, there's no Facebook, no Wikipedia, no YouTube, but instead it's, it's Baidu, it's Sogo, WeChat, Weibo and, and Yuku. So, and even having something as simple as a website that works well in this market, meaning that loads fast, and we were discussing this with, with, with Dan last week, it's not a given, you know, when you, when you don't have a presence on the ground. So we, um, Synovis is the first platform to allow institutions to create, measure and optimize their digital activities in China without the need to be on the ground, without the, without, without the need to, to have a presence on the ground. So hundreds of universities, colleges and, and schools from all around the world are using our software to engage with uh, prospective Chinese students. You know, in the US, we would have uh, UC Berkeley, Purdue, UC Riverside, Central Missouri, Michigan, Oregon, and so forth. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it always. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so my first question is, how can you manage the digital assets needed to effectively engage with Chinese international students? Nico, maybe you'd like to help me with that. Sure, sure. So I think um, uh, two, two main digital assets are, are, are the cornerstone of your digital presence in China. You know, one, the, uh, a website that is optimized for this market, and two, a WeChat official account. Um, uh, first, the website. The website is, is, is important, as everyone would understand, because it allows you to, to establish a powerful presence on Chinese uh, search engines uh, to, to, to cultivate trust, but it's all, it, it can also serve as a, a foundation in agent and partner promotions in, and paid marketing activities. It's also a, way, a great way to, to engage directly with uh, parents and, and students. But the problem is, as, as I mentioned you know, earlier, unless your website is optimized for China, it will load very slowly. Um, research suggests that around 85% of Western websites load too slowly to be useful or fair to load at all. Uh, after about you know, four to five seconds, users usually tend to get frustrated and then you, you know they start to you start to seeing attrition soon after. So 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 all this can really create a negative feelings towards you know brand and create an impression that that your institution is unreliable. So to address this issue, organizations usually host their website in China uh, to make sure that they load quickly and show up in in, in search results. But uh, maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, but but the problem is is that it requires obtaining you know a certain level of ICP of, of licenses uh, called the ICP license or or an ICP filing. Uh, ICP stands for Internet Content Provider, and the whole process costs a lot of money. It can take you know at least twelve months, and it requires usually you to to have a business license in China, which is not you know always easy to have. 
Uh, I experienced this firsthand, by the way, and this is a reason why, you know, uh, I founded Synovis. So th through our software, you know, our clients can now skip this expensive, lengthy process and can launch a website within months uh, that is fully optimized for China. But I mentioned that there were two assets. So the second one is extremely important is the a WeChat official account. Uh, WeChat, for those who don't know, is, is, is a super app. It's everything, you know, uh, and everyone is using, uh, is using, uh, uh, is using uh, uh, WeChat in China. For comparison, you know, it's like a giant Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, Apple Pay, Instagram, all merged into one app and on steroids. So, you know, it has around 1.1, 1.2 billion monthly active users. So it is currently the most powerful and advanced social network application in the world. So, so for this reason, engaging with your audience in China is impossible without, you know, including WeChat into a marketing strategy. But again, same as the website is not as easy as it seems, you know, many Western companies use third parties. Uh, meaning, you know, consultants on the ground or agencies to register their WeChat account, but that's a big mistake. You know, if, if the agency creates the account using their own business license, then technically, you know, they own the followers and it's under their name. Uh, um, so, so in Australia, actually, we, we, we had a, a very high profile case recently that demonstrated just this issue. The, the prime minister official account was registered uh, to an agency. Uh, and it meant that at any point in time, the account could be stopped, could be taken down or sold because, you know, ultimate control of, of, uh, of the account wasn't held by Scott Morrison or his office. And this is what happened. Uh, actually, the, the account was sold to someone who, uh, who rebranded, I think, um, Australian Chinese New Life. Uh, and the new owner had no idea that it was the profile of the prime minister of Australia. He, he simply bought it because, you know, there was a good number of followers. So basically, it boiled down to an issue of who owned the account. And, and uh, uh, it's extremely important to have your own account. It's extremely important to have your own visibility. Uh, um, and and the, the new personal information laws that we'll be talking about during this, uh, this webinar now makes it even more critical because you are legally responsible for your data activity. So, so knowing where your insights is coming from, how the data is being gathered, uh, whether the platform you're utilizing is compliant along with visibility of your own in-house activity is critical. Great, thank you. And you mentioned um, how WeChat is invaluable, basically, when you're trying to target Chinese students. Um, how can you evolve this communication with Chinese international students to kind of maximize not only their recruitment, but their attention? Sure. Is, 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 is this the question for me? Yes, I'll ask oh, you. Yeah. Yes. And, then, and, then, yeah. and then we'll move on to the legal yeah. stuff. Yes, no, no problem. I'm very uh, keen to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so um, it, it's, it, it goes back to content. And it's not that different from, from what we will be doing in, in, in the US, to be honest. So, so finding efficient content creating strategy should be top of mind. You know, on average, people in China spend around six to seven hours a day on their phone. And, and then half of that time is spent on social apps. So uh, engaging, you know, clever content is, is a great way of connecting with your audience uh, on those channels. And so through our platform, we allow you, for instance, to, to, to segment your audience into different groups, meaning that you can push relevant content to specific groups, whether that's prospective students, current students or, or alumni. So for future, future students, for instance, you can, uh, you can talk about new life experience, you can talk about, you know, the, 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 the campus life. Uh, for existing students, you can give them additional communication channel. Uh, and for alumni, you, you can talk about, you know, career development and, and continuity, uh, uh, continuing stud study, sorry. Uh, um, the University of Bolton in the UK is, is a great example, actually. A few years ago, they, they set up a WeChat communication channel for Chinese international, uh, international students in a, in a business school class, I believe. And uh, uh, the, the messages were sent in Chinese. They were facilitated by a Chinese associate a lecturer. And this specific class saw like a huge increase in engagement and performance and motivation, uh, and probably thanks to to just you know having an improved communication communication channel between the uh, between the lecturer and the and the students. Fantastic, thank you. And now Dan, um, I'd love to ask you what must universities and other educators do to ensure they're compliant with China's new laws? Big question. Of, <laughs> yes. I think my initial response is they need to do a lot of guessing uh, because as, a, as Westerners, we tend to be used to laws that are 
of some duration and are clear and are drafted for a specific purpose. Um, China is not that way, and it definitely is not that way with respect to its data privacy laws. Uh, China will often throw out laws just to see how people respond to them. And then depending on how they respond, that will determine how they enforce them. I remember many years ago, China made Skype illegal when everybody in China was Skyping. And they issued the regulation or whatever it was, and they never enforced it. And uh, fortunately, um, the companies that were using Skype at that time, this was a long time ago, they just kept right on using it. They didn't shut it down pursuant to the law. And there's a lot of that going on right now with data privacy in China. They've issued the laws. Um, some, of the, some of the laws are woefully incomplete. There's one law, I can't even remember which one it is off the top of my head, that says that the consent that's signed has to be pursuant to standard terms. They've never said what those standard terms should be. So it's literally impossible to comply with that law. Uh, so there, there, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, uh, but one of the things that we always look at, well, there are two things we look at. One is how would Europe and the United States handle this uh, where China is not clear? And uh, then if we want to be safe, we do that. Um, or we just suggest erring on the side of caution. Um, but a lot of times that doesn't really make sense. And really the underlying um, policy reason for China's data privacy laws isn't data privacy. And I'm gonna say that again, it's not data privacy, even though it claims to be. Um, I have a friend who uh, told me this many years ago, um, and it's still true today. And he said, in the United States, data privacy is mostly geared towards prote protecting the companies. In Europe, it's geared towards protecting the individuals. In China, it's geared toward protecting the government. They are concerned with security more than privacy. They're concerned with keeping their people happy if you look at it optimistically or keeping their people in line if you don't look at it so optimistically. And that's where um, how they look at their data privacy laws. It's not clear that they really care. Meaning this law, these all these laws, uh, I was gonna say they were, they came down, they took effect in November, 2021, but really, those, a lot of the laws that took effect in, the in November 2021 were just sort of reiterations or even repetitions of private previous laws. Um, but it's just not clear that China cares. There's been, the regulators are overworked. There's been virtually no enforcement against foreign companies um, that really matters. And, and later on, I'll talk about who's more likely to get a knock on the door from Chinese government regulators and who isn't. Well, you could, you could tell us about that now, actually. I'd be really interested. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, felt, I felt like I had been talking too long. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, basically, I think that, well, every client of ours, we put it on a spectrum in at least some respect. So for instance, this morning I was talking to a company that need, wanted help with IP protection in China. And they said, can you protect your IP in China? And I said, yeah, you can, 95 to 98% of the time. Uh, if you have the world's best rubber ducky, China doesn't care about that technology 
it will be protected. If you have cutting edge semiconductors, there's not much we lawyers can do um, because they, they're concerned about that. So if you're a college or a university, um, the likelihood of you're getting into trouble due to data privacy reasons is going to, could very well hinge more on the Chinese government's view, views regarding, let's say, American universities that week or Australian universities that week than on um, exactly what you're doing. Um, so um, it's also possible, though I, I have to say I've ne never heard of this, um, and, and one of our lawyers does a lot of work with um, educational institutions in China. Um, it's also possible that if your institution becomes known for being anti-China, that might hurt you in terms of data privacy. Um, I've def I mean, that definitely happens with, let's say the New York Times in terms of uh, access to China. Um, so why couldn't it happen to a college or a university? It hasn't. And I think it's probably because China just doesn't really care that much right now. Um, but it also could matter what country, I mean, it could really matter what country you're in. Uh, for instance, Canada was, um, a lot of ca Canadian businesses, in particular canola oil, which was all but banned in China, were um, greatly discriminated against when Canada was holding Meng Wenzhou of Huawei in jail in Canada. Um, if something like that happens, then um, you're, and you're a Canadian college or university, then all of a sudden you better uh, act with heightened regard for the law. One of the things that's interesting about China is they tend not, the, 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 the Chinese government is a very rational actor and they're not random. So if you're an Australian university and Scott Morrison or someone else in Australia does something that angers China and they decide to go after an Australian university, which I doubt they would because there's, they have bigger fish to fry, uh, like maybe a fishing company or something. Um, they're going to go after, they're not gonna go after the Australian university that's doing everything right and doing their best. They're going to go after the low hanging fruit, the, the Australian university that clearly is making no effort to abide by Chinese law. And then if people say, well, you just went after this university because of what Scott Morrison said, well, they can say, that's not true. They did this, 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 and this, and we let them go for a year and a half. Um, and that tends to be how they act. So there's, we can talk about politics, we can talk about law, but for, in every instance, there's going to be, there's almost always going to be some combination. Mm -hmm. And so as a college or university, your job, if you will, is to be cognizant of what's going on with the politics and what's going on with the law. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, so I think a, a lot of what um, a major issue is the use of data. And obviously men, you mentioned that in different regions of the world, the way that data is viewed, data protection is viewed is very different. Like it could be either more individualistic or to do with the state. But, um, and Nicholas, I think I'd like to ask you about this as well. Um, what data do people, is the most helpful for a university when refining recruitment strategies for Chinese international students? And then I'd like to hear um, Dan's take on the kind of the, the policy behind that really. Sure, uh, well, so, so that would be very similar to, to, uh, to uh, the data that usually universities are leveraging from other countries, uh, everything that can, or any any type of data that uh, uh, allows really to uh, to have a better understanding of uh, the profile of where, where the person is coming from, um, 
uh, which region in particular in China? Because I always say that, you know, sometimes uh, I hear institutions saying we're going after China. I said, well, but China is, is almost, uh, I always describe it as six different countries. Uh, it's, it's even more than, than, than in the US, you know, with the differences between states, because each province will have a, a very different approach. Uh, you know, they, they, and, and in terms of profile of students, there's a huge difference between, between students from Beijing or, or, or Shanghai compared to, you know, Xi'an or, or, or uh, uh, Chengdu, uh, for instance. So, so, so prof data that, that really allows universities to have a better understanding of, you know, who they're talking to will allow them to uh, cater for uh, the needs. Um, also, you know, not only the, the students, but but the parents uh, we, who are also part of the decision making, very, very important uh, factor. Uh, so usually, you know, anything that gives um, information about uh, uh, the person, where, 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 where the person is coming from, um, uh, the parents, uh, 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 it would be extremely, extremely important. But, but going back to, to what Dan was saying, that's where we have to be a bit careful because uh, with the PIPL and it's extremely vague and, and I, I was laughing when Dan was saying that the, there's no specific terms. Uh, it is actually, it, it, there's, there's no generic terms specified, but there's no specific terms as well. And, and if I recall, I think the, the PIPL says that if you are targeting someone who is below a certain age, I think it's 12 or 14, you need to refer to the special terms, but there are no special terms. <laughs> so so it, 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 it does, you know, uh, give uh, a lot of room for interpretation and, and for the government to actually act uh, when needed. So, you know, we always uh, recommend uh, to, 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 uh, to make sure that you are on the, on the, on the side of uh, uh, precaution uh, there. One, one couple of things I'd like to add to a number of things that Nicholas has said is one of the things that's interesting about the Chinese government is surprisingly enough, it's one of the least vindictive, most reasonable governments I've ever dealt with. Um, unless it's deliberately being vindictive for political reasons. And by that, what I mean is that um, their goal is not to crush people. Um, I, I have a Russian friend who lived in Russia for 30 years, then the US for 10 years, then China for 10 years. And he expected China to be like Russia, where he would say that in Russia, a lot of times the bureaucrat will make your life difficult just because they have the power to do so. China is virtually never that way. Their goal is to achieve their goals. And so if their goal is privacy protection, they're not necessarily going to crush you if you did a little thing wrong. That is very rare. And um, a story I tell, which because it's, it's, it's kind of unbelievable, um, and I don't know if it would be quite so true today, but 10 years ago, um, we were representing a company that was had about 3,000 employees in China and was producing literally billions of dollars worth of product a year. Um, in fact, I'm guessing if you're in the United States, you have their product somewhere in your kitchen. And it turned out, and they discovered this, uh, when they learned that their managing director, who they were uh, paying about $150,000 a year to, had an $18 million condo in Hong Kong. So then they investigated and they learned that obviously there was a huge amount of embezzling going on. So then we were hired and the first thing we did was looked up the company to see what had been going on with the company there was no company. All of the taxes that this company had supposedly been paying and even the cost to form the company had been embezzled. And there had been no company for five years. And so we did what we always do in situations like this is we tell our clients, look, if you get caught tomorrow, you are in really, really big trouble. If we go to the government and tell them that this is what happened and we're sorry, things will be better for you. 
So we went to the government and it was unbelievably easy. They said, look, we understand. Don't bother with the, you know, pay, pay your taxes for the last year, not the last five years. Get on the grid like you're supposed to do and everything will be fine. And that's all that happened. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> Nicholas's eyes are raising because that's not how it would work in the United States. That's not how it would work in Australia. But that is often how it works in China. So the reason I mention all this is because both Nicholas and I have been talking about how vague the rules are. And so I'm sure people are worried, like, uh, you know, we're going to violate these rules without knowing it and then get in big trouble. That's probably not going to happen because they're, they're not unreasonable. They're, they're going to say, well, you didn't use the standard terms. You did the best thing you could. Uh, we're not going to fine you $100,000. That just doesn't happen in China. Now, as a lawyer, I have to do the disclaimer, which is I can't promise that it won't happen, but it's never happened. Um, so you, you can all relax probably at least a, a level from uh, what you were expecting here. Uh, to follow up on a couple more things that Nicholas said, uh, China, it's, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. It's six different countries. Actually, for some reason, I had seven in my head, uh, but six, seven, it really is. I mean, there are different languages. I, I, I always uh, push back at people. Who describe, people will say, do you want to go out for Chinese food tonight? Well, what does that mean? I mean, there's spicy food from some regions, there's Shanghai food, which is more like Japanese food. Uh, I mean, China is a huge country. So it really is critical that you get help uh, in figuring out how to navigate um, China. I mean, urban, rural, et cetera. I, I'm sure most of you already know that, but I, I wanted to emphasize it because when you look at foreign countries, you tend to, to think, you know, they're one giant homogenous mass, the homogeneous mass, uh, because you don't know um, the particulars well. And, and China definitely isn't that. And, and one other follow up I'm going to make is, uh, and I'm going to say it even stronger than Nicholas, you cannot in, unless you're huge and have a ton of money and a ton of help and get lucky, you are not going to have your own complete website in China. Uh, people, uh, people come to us and say, you know, I'd like to get an ICP license to do A, B, and C in China. And we basically tell them, well, that's great. It's going to be a minimum of $100,000. It's going to take at least a year or two. And the odds are we're going to fail. And so nobody hires us for that, which is a good thing because we don't like taking on matters where we're convinced we're going to fail. It just doesn't really happen because China wants um, their internet to be as local as it can be. That's why it's slow outside China. Oftentimes they'll deliberately slow it down. They, they, they're trying to essentially and slowly create their own internet and WeChat's the same sort of thing. It's, it's become everything to everybody and that's by design to keep everybody within the essentially China bubble. And so if you're not in that China bubble, you're not in China. Uh, if you're not in the China internet and communications bubble, uh, you're nowhere. I mean, truly nowhere. Yeah, that's that really falls onto something I want to ask you, Nicholas, about how how does what Dan's been saying relate to conversations you've been having with clients? And can you give us some examples of sort of cases where you've been able to help clients overcome their issues they're finding in, for example, not being able to have a big website presence? Oh, yes. Well, this is and this is. So everything that Dan uh, explained is actually I went through this, you know, uh, uh, firsthand. I, I experimented everything. <laughs> I, I probably set up three different uh, holding on foreign entity in China uh, across my, my career. 
Uh, the first time it took us two years uh, and it cost us $100,000. Uh, the second time it cost us like a, a year. Uh, it took us a, a year and the last time it took us six months. So this is all about, you know, who you're talking to and, and how you do things. But, but it, 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 Dan is right. It's, it would be almost impossible to, uh, to have a full website in China. We, we developed a, a software, a marketing software that doesn't do miracles in the sense that if your content is not compliant with the uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, firewall, the, the, the Golden Shield project, the Great Firewall, there's nothing that, that we can do. Uh, but what we can guarantee is that on the technology side, uh, on the technical side, everything will be handled through the platform. So we, we develop a software that allows anyone to create, measure and optimize their, their website uh, uh, that will be visible with a fast loading time in China without the need to be hosted in China, uh, because obviously it's actually you know, illegal to do that. We, we do have clients who went through third parties to host their website in China, leveraging ICP, you know, uh, license of, uh, of agencies. And obviously they were blocked, you know, uh, uh, by, by the Chinese government. Uh, and again, it happened like one, one day after, uh, after several years, as Dan mentioned, you know, they let it go for several years and then they realized that it was not the right ICP and they blocked, uh, they blocked the, 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 the website. So this is not what we're doing because this is illegal. We do have servers in China. If you are, if we, if you'd like us to host it in China, you need to have an ICP. Some institutions do have an ICP. In this case, it's, it's a, for the precision, it's more an ICP filing than an ICP license because they're not allowed to have a, a, an ICP license unless they have, you know, a, a, a majority stake from from a, a Chinese entity. Uh, uh, but they can they can have you know website hosted in China. But the vast majority of institutions can't. So our platform, what the platform allows to, to, to do is is to host this website outside of China, all around China, uh, whatever it is, you know, Hong Kong, you know. Taiwan, uh, which is considered as, as China by, by, by the government in China, but is not right now, uh, but also you know, South, South Korea. And our platform keep optimizing in real time everything to make sure that you are 100% compliant. So, so uh, with that in mind, you know, all the universities that are leveraging our platform, it allows them to, to create you know, a specific microsite for China that would be fully visible. And what a lot of institutions do is that they usually redirect this website to their own website, but at least the first uh, the first visits and uh, and the first pages that people are seeing uh, are fully optimized and fully visible. So that's the way how we we help institutions uh, uh, by making them visible in China. Uh, the the other way how we we help them is also by giving them visibility because the second issue that you're facing when you when you go after China is the lack of visibility and lack of understanding. So our platform gives you actually this level of visibility in terms of uh, in terms of uh, performance, in terms of you know uh, traffic data. Uh, uh, and, and this is the reason why we had to go through a very thorough process to be compliant, you know, with uh, with the PIPL because obviously, you know, we are a, a data processor. Uh, uh, so, so, so uh, this is the other way how we we can help institutions is by also giving them, you know, visibility. And the last, the last, you know, way how we help them is to optimize it, because you know, China is different, and the way how you optimize your assets in the West is actually different uh, from the way how you would do it in China. So our platform allows you to. To, uh, to do that for specifically for this market. You know, as an example, uh, you know, Google doesn't exist, as I said, but you have Baidu, uh, you have Sogo, you have 360, you have Shenmai, you have actually four search engines in China. Our platform allows you to optimize your content for those search engines, uh, you know, uh, uh, so because the algorithms are, are working slightly differently from Google. So that's the, the three ways how we will uh, be helping institutions. Fantastic. And how have you found that this has played out with um, recruitment? Because I think that's one of the biggest issues that people are finding at the moment. As we mentioned before, obviously, post pandemic, there's some sometimes less people are less keen to move abroad. So in what way can you really get Chinese students involved with your institution? How can you how can you grab them? I think we also had a um, something in our chat that asked, is WeChat the only successful communication channel? And does email have any success? So when you're looking to target those prospective Chinese students, what's what's the best way forward? Yeah, so so there, there are quite a few different questions here. Uh, but yes. I, I can answer straight away with the email. Yes, email is not used in China uh, mm -hmm. unless unless you work with someone who is in an international company and would be used to check that they, they, they would be they, they would be used to use email. 
uh, uh, it's it's not it's not used it, mainly because it's 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 spammed a lot and people are rarely checking their, their email addresses. Uh, even my own team in Shanghai, you know, if I want to usually have an answer quicker, I would be using WeChat because if I send an email, I know that I would have, have received an answer like you know a few days later. So so email definitely not using uh, uh, email in China. WeChat will be will be definitely uh, one of the main channel uh, to use to to outreach uh, to this audience. But it's a little bit more complicated than that you know that you i think institutions need to to have a clear understanding of the journey of the prospective students because it's it's not a i go on wechat and then i make my decision they usually you know would probably hear about your institutions uh from a fair um uh or from an agent uh, and then they would be searching on Baidu about your institutions. So obviously you need to be to be uh, visible there uh they will refer to your official site to get you know the official voice, the uh, and 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 better understand you know uh, information about your institutions, about quite a few things. Parents as well will be actually referring more to the website. Then they will go on WeChat, and then it will be asking you know uh, their their inner circle if anyone has any uh, any uh, any um, any information about the institutions. They will be you know looking for groups. They will be uh, uh, checking on Weibo. Uh, they will look at portals in China that you know rank all the different universities. Then they will go back to the website. So, so it's a it's a journey where they interact with you know six to seven different channels uh, uh, throughout those those uh, the, the, throughout the journey. What is really important is to make sure that your website is actually answering the questions that they have and having a WeChat official account. That's two mm -hmm. two most important one. But then you can add being visible on certain portals. Uh, I wouldn't say that Weibo would be the best channel uh, for institutions because it's more it's more B2C and retail, uh, uh, but definitely WeChat, uh, definitely uh, uh, the website. Um, it's also very important to make sure that the, the content, as I said earlier, is adapted based on, on who is uh, who you are interacting with, because it's not the, you, you don't you don't communicate the same uh, elements of information, depending if it's a, a prospective students or or it's a it's a parent, for instance. Uh, so I think that was the two questions, right? WeChat, uh, uh, the channel, email, and oh, and online as well. Um, there was a question, I think, Julia. On, yes. On... So I'm wondering about kind of how how you, you're advising universities to adapt their recruitment strategy when they they may not be able to do it in the same way they would recruit, for example, a student in the states. Oh yes. Yeah. So so definitely. Um, uh, well, in the states, it would be similar in the sense where digital is 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 everywhere. I mean, it was before. Before the pandemic, I used to to say that you know uh, in China digital was uh, nice to have you know uh, five seven years ago uh, three years ago it was important you know since the pandemic is, has become crucial but I think it's it's relevant everywhere really but but in China even more because as I said it's a it's extremely digital savvy uh, population where there are things that you know people are using in the big cities to pay you know for. Um, uh, uh for for inventing machines with their with their you know faces for instance so 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 it's it's extremely uh, digital uh savvy population the, the gen z is is uh is uh, relying heavily also on um uh re reviews and uh and referrals uh, as a matter of fact I, I think that there was a survey that showed that around 80 percent of china uh china's gen z named online reviews as one of their top three influences during the decision process and uh and around 70% of them identify the importance of friends or family uh, suggestions via the internet. So uh, definitely adapt your approach in terms of recruitment by being much more digital, uh, by, 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 by relying much more on reviews, uh, by tapping into your, your, your alumni base. I think it's something that you know, institutions don't yes, do Yes, so I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I'd love, yeah, I'd yeah. love to hear about how to, how to get the alumni involved. Yeah, th so this, this, this is crucial. You know, I, I'm, I'm often asked, okay, uh, what influences could we use, uh, uh, could we leverage to push our institutions? And, and those influences are in China are, are called the KOLs, the, the key opinion leaders. And I always reply, well, start with your, your, you know, your alumni base, because, because that's the best influences that you can have. They're, they're back in China. They can talk about your, the experience that they had. They, they are, have, you know, uh, an, a connection an emotional connection with your institutions. Uh, I, we have, I have a, actually a personal experience i have a, one of my colleague she um she is chinese she studied in ireland um her bachelor's degree and then she was looking where to do her master's degree and she was keep seeing you know on wechat 
moment, which is the equivalent of the Facebook wall, uh, she was keep seeing you know posts from a friend of hers who was studying in Australia at uh, UNSW. Uh, and, and so she, she outreached to her and said, you know, you know uh, can you share it a bit more? And then she started to do some research, went on the website, talked to other people, came to Australia, did her master's degree here, stayed here, worked for Synovus. <laughs> so, so, so this is a, this is a great example of how, you know, uh, it is how important it is actually to make sure that you, whatever is said about your institution, uh, uh, uh is, is good, you know, leveraging as much as possible alumni. Uh, to do that, uh, it's usually very cost effective rather than paying someone to say something about your institution. Uh, so reviews, as I was saying, is extremely important. Um, uh, influences from your alumni base would be extremely important. And but overall, making sure that your whole approach is is very digital oriented. We, and, my oh, law yeah, firm, okay, my law firm does a lot of work for luxury goods companies. Um, and through that work, I've worked with a company that does consulting for luxury goods companies in the United States to get Chinese customers. And um, I hope I don't offend anyone here, but luxury goods, as, as someone who has a daughter in her first year of law school, uh, I view uh, at least cost-wise, education is very similar to luxury goods. Um, and what th this consultant told me is that one of their biggest factors for getting someone to, let's say, go to Hermes instead of, um, I don't know, some other lux luxury goods, Cartier, um, is Chinese, people on the ground in the United States. And I've seen that in my own firm when um, let's say someone's coming to the United States from China, they will ask people they know, Chinese people they know in the United States, where they should stay, what cities they should go to, what uh, purses they should buy, et cetera. I don't think it's really all that different from what everyone does around the world but it really is done on WeChat. And a lot of times, if you're, if you're on WeChat, let's say you're Hermes and you're on WeChat and someone says, you know, what, where should I get a purse? And the, the responder says Hermes, and then they link you over to what they're doing on WeChat. That's, that's very powerful. Uh, and I don't, I, I'm not gonna claim that I'm an expert on, um, college and university recruiting, but I can, listening to Nicholas, I can see where it would be very, very similar um, because that, I mean, that is how Chinese consumers buy. It, it, it is a lot of referral. It is a lot of joining groups, talking to people they know. It's, it's um, trust is very important and you get your trust from the people you know. Yeah. Definitely, and that actually kind of goes along with what I was going to ask next um, about trust. So obviously, um, Nicholas, you're working as a kind of a conduit between universities and Chinese students. Um, what responsibilities do universities have as, their, as part of their partnership with you? Uh, you mean in terms of... Uh, in terms of... Sorry. Data? In, you yes, mean in, in terms, terms of protecting, of protecting data? data? Yeah, and yeah. keeping their part of the kind of legal side Clear. Sure. Yes. Uh, yes. So I, I can I can definitely share what, what, what we're doing, but I think that then would be also better suited to to uh, give recommendations uh, or yes, ideas at least. Yeah, we'd definitely love to hear uh, from Dan as well. Uh, but but yeah. So 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 Synobis, like like any uh, software as a service uh, platform, operates under a shared responsibility model, which means that we, uh, the SaaS provider, ensure that our platform is available, stable, and secure. Uh, what our clients are responsible for reviewing their data strategy and, 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 and privacy policies, and, and obviously checking whether they are compliant or not. So as an example, you know, uh, because you need to notify and inform the data subject of their rights, why and how you collect data and what you do with it, you, you can need an up-to-date and compliant data privacy policy written in Chinese. Uh, and it's often not the case. 
Um, another example would be before collecting any personal information, you must get clear consent to its use. And this is the reason why, you know, at Synovis, we went through, as I mentioned earlier, a thorough compliance process. We, we can show our security and encryption standards meet or exceed the requirements of the PIPL. Uh, we've also introduced a new feature to protect people's data, data rights, like mandatory consent boxes in all our platform uh, contact forms. So, so when an institution is, is creating a, an application form or a contact form, there's, there's this you know, mandatory uh, consent uh, checkbox uh, uh, in order to, to make sure that they are compliant. But it's a, it's a shared responsibility model that and I often say, you know, it's not because you're using a tool that is, is compliant that it, it means that you don't have to do anything. And, and that might be a good segue to, to what Dan might have to say there. Yeah, um, Nicholas brought up something really interesting and incredibly important. And it's so important that it's second nature to me, so I didn't even think about it. And that is the fact that you're dealing with a foreign country. And so I, I shouldn't have to say this, but we've had, I mean, it's amazing how many times uh, companies have come to us, including really big companies, let's say a branch office, and they'll have, let's say, 15 employees in the branch office, and they're all Chinese, and their employment contract is in English. Uh, that doesn't fly. It does not fly. Just like your employment contracts in the United States aren't in Chinese. So 100% uh, everything you're doing uh, regarding data privacy has to be in Chinese. Uh, and that means if you're going to get consent, which you should for most things, uh, well, basically uh, any personal information, you should get consent for to get first. Um, and personal information includes anything that can be linked to one individual. Anonymous data, far less important. But if you're going to be getting cell phone numbers, addresses, et cetera, you want consent. You want consent to, you, to get it basically. And you want, you even want to be on the safe side, consent to, as to where you're going to send it. Uh, so by that, what I mean is obviously if it says, uh, you know, XYZ University is going to use this information for these purposes, uh, you've gotten consent to use the information for those purposes, but we would advocate that you make clear not only what you're going to be using it for, but where, because you're going to essentially be taking that information from China and moving it to Australia, moving it to Canada, moving it to the United States, and you should get clear consent for that as well. That's actually a great example of where uh, our lawyers are clear, even if the law isn't necessarily clear. That's where we tend to borrow from um, US um, and EU laws, um, meaning this is where you want to be very careful. And typically, you can be very careful. It, 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 it's not going to be harmful to you usually, especially if um, everybody else is doing it. Um, I'm also gonna add something regarding email and um, WeChat. Uh, I hate WeChat um, because as a law firm, when we, uh, we mostly rep, probably 98% of our clients are American, Canadian, Australian, even South Korean, New Zealand, whatever. We tend not to represent Chinese companies, but occasionally we do. And they always want to WeChat with us. And that can be very difficult because it doesn't give, they, they, they want to WeChat and they expect an answer in, three minutes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it, it, it can be overwhelming. And as a law firm, I don't want to be giving an answer to something that's sent to me in Chinese in three minutes. 
So we tend to try very hard to push our Chinese clients onto email. And it's not that tough because these are company, Chinese companies that are doing business internationally. But we represented um, about 90 plaintiffs who were defrauded in an immigration scam, 90 Chinese plaintiffs. And we literally had to hire a Chinese lawyer who did, whose sole job, we hired her temporarily from the University of Washington. Her sole job was to be on WeChat all day. So it, 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 can, it can be a, a, a lot of work, but if you're pushing 20 year, or 17 year olds to email, uh, my guess is they're going to think that your education institution hasn't done anything big since 1933. Uh, because we, WeChat, as important as it is to everything in China, 17, 18, 19 year olds, it is their life. Definitely. And we've actually had um, a really interesting question in on the Q&A box, and I would encourage all the audience who have questions to please submit them because we have less than 10 minutes left of our allotted time, so you might might not get an answer if you don't put one in soon. Um, so um, Ismail Fayed has asked, does the Chinese government share technical guidelines for international universities on how to set up their learning environments and the acceptable technologies or learning apps they may introduce to Chinese students? Wow. Okay. So first off, I don't know what the word sus up, I don't know what sus up means. Um, that must be a, a, a oh, British to set phrase. Up. Sorry, set up. That oh, set up. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would, well, Nicholas, if you know, if you have a really good answer to this, I'm going to turn it over to you because I'm just going to be speculating a bit. I, I actually don't. I, 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 I think that what my, my thing is that there's no, <laughs> not to my, to, to my knowledge. Uh, uh, um, Usually, it's always always being compliant with the the Great Firewall regulation. Uh, there are certain things that you're not allowed to talk about. Uh, if you talk about, they will be blocked. Um, they will always encourage you to have everything in China to be much more in control. But again, it's not always possible because you might not be simply allowed to to have something in China. Um, so so. There's no clear uh, guidance from the government besides, you know, just making sure that you, you follow you follow what the the, the censorship uh, uh, regulation is, is all about. Uh, what we can what we can share is that there are uh, obviously things to do and things not to do uh, uh, in order to make sure that you optimize your you maximize your chances to be uh, visible in, in, in China. Um, uh, those are obviously, as I said, uh, in terms of content, it's uh, it's uh, it's a no brainer. Uh, but besides, we are also entering an issue in China where there's the, the, the censorship in itself, but there's also the, um, the intermediaries, the, the technology, the, the platforms. And the platforms, in order not to have any issues with the government, are actually applying their own censorship right? and, and you, sometimes even higher. So i give you an example that is not re really related to, uh, to higher education, but I think it will illustrate well my point. We, we had an issue one day with a client who was pushing in WeChat, you know, um, a promotion and and they were saying you know save save a lot of uh, dollars and there were dollar signs uh you know several dollar signs put in the in the headings of the wechat post and the wechat post was published on our platform and it was not and, and it was then published on wechat and it was not visible and so the the, the client complained and said you know the platform doesn't work you know, what's happening and we actually investigate and we saw that actually it was working but there was a rule within WeChat that no one knew about, which is when you put too many dollar signs, it's considered as a spam because you it's considered as false uh, promotion. Uh, so automatically it was removed by the bot and no one saw it even and the government didn't see it. So so th these happen a lot. Uh, this happened a lot. And there's no there's no rule written. It's you, unfortunately you just have to do it and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, we can share, you know, our own experience because as we're working with a lot of clients, we can share, you know, what happened in the past, provide recommendations. We can share also uh, uh, some terms and our platform does actually provide some uh, uh, alerts if you are using specific terms that are blocked in China uh, or sensitive, considered as sensitive, uh, beyond the, the traditional ones. If you if you want to talk about you know, Tibet, uh, Uyghur, or so forth, this is 100% would be blocked. But 
uh, there are specific terms that you shouldn't be using, and and our platform actually uh, can can trigger you know some some uh, some alerts and telling you when you're using some terms that you are taking the risk that your content will be blocked. So so uh, it's it's all this is not from the government. There are ways how to optimize your 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 content and what you're publishing. The other the other approach besides content is how you do it. So you need to use a platform that is fully compliant, like like ours, for instance. Uh, we are we are actually hosted in an environment even outside China that is compliant with the PIPL, and this is extremely important uh, uh, because you know we are we are responsible and we 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 um, we are responsible and we need to be able to be audited anytime, even as if we were in China. And we did that on purpose to make sure that you know everything everything was fine. But also the way how you the way the technology that you're using, right? So so for instance, a lot of people are using. Google Analytics to track, you know, their, their performance uh, website, and it's Google Analytics, so it's not like Google the search engine. But because it's a Google service, it's blocked in China, and because it's blocked in China, it will slow down the loading time if you're using Google Analytics. Same as Google Maps, same as all those services that are that are blocked in China. So, so I would say three three uh, ways to to make sure that you can be visible, whatever it is in terms of learnings or, or recruitment. Uh, uh, the content needs to be to be uh, obviously uh, uh, compliant. Uh, the platform uh, that you're leveraging to do that needs to be 100% compliant, and also uh, the technology that you're using, uh, uh, the scripts needs to be uh, also allowed in China. That would be the three ways how you can maximize your chances really to uh, to be visible in this market. So it's interesting because I think I misunderstood the question. I thought that the question related to what you're allowed to do outside China, and as far as I know. There's really nothing um, in Chinese law that deals with that. In terms of what you're doing in China, um, as a lawyer, I would say there are three things to think about. One, China has very strict consumer protection laws. And um, they also have, if, if you violate um, the way people in China think you should be operating, uh, your company can your company or your university can literally blow up on the internet. Well, not literally, figuratively, blow up on the internet with people who are angry with you. So you you need to be very careful about that because word can definitely get around fast. And um, we used to uh, get contacted by universities, and I, I suspect that COVID has led to a decline in this, who were having trouble, they would have recruiters in China who they were paying, who were making promises that the university just couldn't keep. And they didn't know that those promises were being made until the students were on campus. And that, that didn't work out well for them. Um, in terms of figuring out what you can say and what you can't say, we actually, um, one of our lawyers in China does a lot of movie and entertainment work represents a lot of studios and he deals with that issue all the time and there is no you know don't talk about tibet don't talk about xinjiang beyond that it gets very very complicated and um you you, you need to be careful when, when nicholas was talking about dollar signs i didn't know that it was going to be spam i thought that it might be that they don't want people using dollars uh, you know, so that's the kind of thing where you, it, it, it's, it's hard to know what's going on. One third thing that I would recommend, so we, we've got, you know, the consumer protection laws, you've got the censorship laws. One other thing I'm going to throw out there, because this comes as a surprise to people in the United States, Canada, and Australia, but not in most of the rest of the world. And that is, before you do anything in China, you should have a trademark in China. Because um, the United States, Australia, and Canada are countries where the first to use a trademark gets it. So if you're the University of Michigan, um, you don't necessarily have to register your trademark. You've used it. It's yours. But if I went to China, uh, right, or if I, if the University of Michigan hasn't registered their trademark in China under educational institutions, I might be able to register it and keep it. 
just like um, somebody could register Scott Morrison's name uh, for something and use it. Um, so you have got to be first. Now there is one exception, which is well-known brand, but that has to be a well-known brand in China. And so University of Michigan might qualify, but I went to tiny Grinnell College uh, with 1400 students and I doubt that it would. And I doubt that most universities or colleges would qualify for that. And even big names, I say to them, look, do you wanna take this risk? I mean, we charge about $2,000 for a trademark. You can take the risk. Somebody registers your trademark, that's a $300,000 lawsuit and they tend not to take it. So securing your trademark, if you're going to be doing anything in China is, I, I call it the no brainer of Chinese law, you need it. Great, well, unfortunately that brings us to the end of our 60 minute discussion. Um, but I'd really like to thank everyone for taking part today, especially um, Nico and Dan, you've been fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing all your insights. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that a recording and summary article of this webinar will be available on the Times Higher Education website. It'll also be emailed to you along with Dan's PDF if you haven't had a chance to save it. Um, and I hope you've hope you've all enjoyed today and we look forward to engaging you um, engaging with you at future THE events. So thanks so much and goodbye.